tonight, treacherous conditions as a blast of winter slams southern Ontario. A massive pile of deadly accidents, and that storm is not done yet. Mourning the victims of the London attack, and one of the men who fought back speaks out. The premiers plan their wish list, but can they all get on the same page? Now everything's starting to work again. And Ryan's remarkable progress, how Thailand paid tribute to the humble Bronco. This is The National. Millions of people living in southern Ontario are being warned to stay home and off the roads because of a winter storm, bringing, you know it, a dangerous mix of ice, wind and snow. Tonight, it has turned deadly. The storm led to a massive pileup near Kingston, virtually shutting down part of Canada's busiest highway, and it caused major delays at Toronto's airports. There is similar chaos south of the border. In the U.S., two separate weather systems, one on each side of the country, left 50 million people under some kind of winter storm advisory, causing serious trouble for travelers at the end of their Thanksgiving weekend. But we begin our coverage here in Toronto tonight with Shannon Martin. This stretch of the 401 brought to a standstill after a terrifying 30 to 40 vehicle pileup. The highway snow packed with whiteout conditions. As many as 30 people were sent to hospital. So far, one person is confirmed dead. We don't know the exact cause as of yet. That's going to be the part of the investigation. We do have our uh, traffic collision investigators. There's two going to be here for a period of time to do the technical part of the, the reconstruction and investigation. The day started deadly. A 24-year-old woman from St. Catharines was killed early this morning. That's her crumpled SUV after colliding with a semi-trailer. As fast as we clear them, uh, more seem to be, be coming in. The freezing rain, drizzle, ice pellets, uh, whatever it is that's coming down is certainly making it uh, treacherous on the roads. Hours of on and off freezing rain, then snow, then back to rain again, turned roads into skating rinks coated windshields and weighed down tree branches. You can see those, uh, how much ice is on there, and that is seriously heavy. Looking at about five to seven millimeters of accretion on this tree. Winds whipped beyond 70 kilometers an hour. It's harsh and it hurts your face. Leaving thousands without power. Winter's first big blast in these parts, prompting a rare sight at the downtown airport, planes sitting parked. Over at Pearson International, nearly 20% of all departures were cancelled, many more delayed. And it's not over yet. The nightmare mix of freezing rain and snow is expected overnight and through tomorrow. Looking at this storm in the forecasting, it probably will be an all-hands-on-deck event. At the ready, 10,000 tons of salt and 1,100 pieces of snow-clearing equipment. And from police, a request slow down and plan ahead. If you're setting your alarm, uh, give yourself some extra time uh, tomorrow morning. You may need it. Shannon Martin, CBC News, Toronto. That same winter storm is expected to make its way east tomorrow and stick around into Wednesday. Special weather advisories are already in effect for much of Atlantic Canada and parts of the U.S. are dealing with their own weather mess. I thought it was supposed to leave tomorrow at 9 a.m., but the storm's coming, I think, tonight. Two other storms led to hundreds of cancelled flights and thousands of delays on what's one of the busiest travel days of the year after the Thanksgiving break. And the bad weather is expected to stretch into Tuesday. To the UK now and the aftermath of Friday's deadly attack, we know now the names of both people killed. They were young, passionate and committed to justice. In fact, they were involved in a program designed to help former prisoners, including their attacker. Anita Bath explains. It's not fair. This, this world has changed. Friends remember Saskia Jones as a determined Cambridge University graduate who wanted to join the police. Instead, her life ended violently on Friday. She would have stood her ground, which breaks my heart even more because she would have stood up for herself. Jones's attacker, Usman Khan, ran after stabbing her. Brave bystanders chased him down. They used fire extinguishers, they used chairs. They used these narwhal tusks ripped off the wall in the heat of the moment. They held Khan on the ground before officers arrived to shoot him dead. Toby Williamson runs the venue where the attack took place. 
and to be one yard away from that, to make emergency calls, to hit alarms, and then to simply follow training, the procedure of evacuation in a scene of chaos, they did all right. Jones volunteered with the prison rehabilitation program Learning Together, alongside Jack Merritt, who was also killed. The group had gathered for a conference the day of the attack. I met Jack only once, but I must say that he uh, impressed me. He really believed that the work that Learning Together is doing is fundamental for the future of our society. Their attacker was at that same conference. He used the program after he received early release from a prison sentence for plotting terrorism. That early release, now a key election issue, with Boris Johnson promising stronger sentences for terrorism. I think it's repulsive that individuals as dangerous as this man should be allowed out after serving only eight years. Labour points to recent Conservative cuts to public services like probation and policing. Miss chances to intervene in the lives of people who go on to commit absolutely inexcusable acts. As politicians play the blame game, the families of the victims are trying to understand how and why they're suffering unimaginable loss. Anita Bath, CBC News, Vancouver. So as you saw in Anita's story, bystanders who somehow bravely chased down and then stopped the attacker are being called heroes. Their courage caught on camera. Wielding a fire extinguisher and a narwhal tusk, these three men chased Khan down the London Bridge. Others joined in to help. One of them, Thomas Gray, tried to disarm the attacker. He spoke with BBC Radio about what happened, and here he is for the record. Just kind of held him there and, uh, and did what we could um, until the police arrived. My attention was brought back to, to the suspect um, and saw that you know, he had a knife in either hand, um, so decided to... Uh, just kind of stamp on his left wrist as, as hard as I could to try and free one of the knives off as it appeared to be sort of taped to his hand, really. I saw the fire extinguisher was laid out on the floor and where it was in between a couple of the people's legs. I didn't want anyone to fall or, or to hurt themselves on it. So I pulled that out of the way. Then whilst I was there and then realised what was going on, I was kind of like, well, I can't run away now. I've got to stick it out and, and, and help out as best I can. Only thing that we heard from, from the suspect um, was get off of me. Um, that's all we heard. The overall residing sort of message from um, all of the, the chaps involved was it's not going to happen. Of the three people injured in the attack, one has returned home. The other two are still in hospital and are in stable condition. An Irish woman turned ISIS bride was arrested today when she landed in her home country. So you can sort of make out the police escorting Lisa Smith and her young daughter at the Dublin airport after they were deported by Turkey. The daughter was born in Syria, where Smith had been held along with other ISIS families. In March, she told CNN she wanted to go home even if it meant prison. Well, I know they'd strip me off my passport and stuff and I wouldn't travel and I'd be watched, kind of. But prisons? I don't know. No. I'm already in prison. <laughs> You may recall as many as 32 Canadians have been held in Syrian camps, including nine women and 17 children. Their fate could become a political issue here if they start being sent home. Last month, Turkey began returning alleged foreign ISIS fighters to their home countries. But so far, says Turkey, it hasn't found Canadians in its custody. The country's premiers are gathering in Toronto tonight. It's their first opportunity to meet since the federal election and plan for how to deal with Trudeau's minority government. But can they all agree? David Cochran looks at what's on the agenda. They've gone to court and waged political war with the Prime Minister over his climate plan. Now they're going nuclear. Implementing small modular reactors will provide meaningful action in reducing our carbon emissions in electricity production. A three-province agreement to develop small-scale nuclear reactors. The opening move in a winter gathering of Canada's premiers at a time when agreement has been hard to find. In light of the, the divisions that we saw on the federal election evening and is there a place for premiers to come together, uh, come to a consensus on a few items on behalf of all Canadians and come to that consensus to, uh, to provide that direction for the steps forward. Justin Trudeau has been meeting with the premiers one by one and will meet with them as a group in the new year. The premiers are meeting in Toronto to sort out their goals for that meeting. 
for Ontario, it's, <clears throat> it's always economic development and, and jobs. And I think for, for New Brunswick, certainly the, the outstanding issue that's been there for a while is the softwood lumber agreement. Expect that list to grow as more premiers arrive. Our focus, frankly, is on issues of immediate concern to, to Albertans. Jason Kenney has the biggest demands, at least in raw dollar amounts, wanting support from his colleagues and billions from Ottawa to offset the hit his economy has taken from the oil slump. I think we're going to see, uh, hopefully, a strong consensus on the fiscal stabilization program, the equalization rebate, and on Bill C-69. I will listen to what my colleagues have to say about um, increasing health transfers, um, but uh, our focus, again, is on those other issues. And David, you're in Toronto outside that spot where the Premier's had a private dinner in advance of the talk. So could we chat about what we can expect from that meeting tomorrow, especially around health care? Yeah, on healthcare, Adrian, there's a lot of common ground at the Premier's tables. They all agree on one thing, and that's they want more money from the federal government. The annual rate of transfers to the provinces grows at about 3% a year. They want that bumped up to 5.2%. Now, it's only a couple of percentage points, but it's billions of dollars. The Premier's want it. The problem is, is the Prime Minister doesn't necessarily want to give it. Justin Trudeau has resisted just upping the cash he gives to the province on health care. Instead, he wants to focus on specific targeted programs that expand service. Number one right now is Pharmacare, which is something the Liberals campaigned on in the last election and they want to do or at least start over the next little while. So expect some pushback from Ottawa there on a general increase focusing more on Pharmacare. And the problem, Adrian, is while they agree they all want more money from the federal government, one premier told me tonight there is no consensus at their table on what to do about Pharmacare. All right. Thanks, David. David Cochran with the premiers tonight. A crucial new phase begins this week in the impeachment proceedings in Washington. With the investigation by the House Intelligence Committee over, the House Judiciary Committee is next to consider formal charges against the president. But as Paul Hunter reports, this evening Donald Trump is digging in. Having labeled it a witch hunt and a phony hoax, tonight Donald Trump took on the impeachment process again. With the White House telling Democrats that despite an invitation, Trump lawyers will not take part in new hearings set to begin Wednesday. This, as lawmakers return to Capitol Hill this week and the entire impeachment process moves to a new stage with an examination of what exactly is an impeachable offense. In prior hearings last month, witness after witness told their versions of the same broad story, that Trump tried to pressure Ukrainian President Zelensky into digging up dirt on Trump rival Joe Biden. Say Democrats, an abuse of presidential powers aimed at personal political gain for Trump. Based on what they've learned so far, Say some. I've made very clear I think this is impeachable conduct. It's the Ukrainian aspect, note others, that sets Trump apart from both Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton and their impeachment processes. This conduct is more serious. Democrat Zoe Lofgren, the only lawmaker to have worked the Nixon, Clinton, and Trump hearings, underlines the U.S. Constitution forbids the kind of thing Trump is said to have done. What the founding fathers were concerned about. It was the interference by foreign governments in our political system that was one of their gravest concerns. Tonight, as lawmakers prepare to make the case, even without Trump's lawyers on hand, that it is indeed impeachable, Trump has another call to make. Whether he himself will testify in his own defense, a deadline for that decision is Friday. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Former Humboldt Bronco Ryan Strashnitsky has made remarkable progress since the bus crash that left him partially paralyzed over a year ago. He spent the last few weeks in Thailand undergoing experimental surgery there. As Carolyn Dunn shows us, a local hockey team found a fitting way to show their support. They rolled out the red carpet literally for Ryan Strashnitsky. Ryan was invited by an expat hockey league to drop the game puck. I can't say enough about this guy's courage. I mean, we all get hung up on our little everyday problems and just to see the stuff that this kid is going through and the way that he's dealing with his adversity, it was an inspiration to all of us here. Ryan arrived in Thailand a month ago to have an epidural stimulator implanted above his spinal cord injury. The device is sending electrical impulses down Ryan's nerve pathways that are preserved but dormant. 
I mean, right away, uh, as soon as the surgery was done and I was able to do physio, um, they started moving my legs right away. And you know, from there, it's just hard work. I've noticed anything below my chest that was paralyzed before is able to be controlled through the uh, electrical stimulator and you know, everything's starting to work again. This procedure is not yet approved in Canada for specific treatment of spinal cord injury, although it's been used for pain management for decades. There's still much research to be done. But Barry Monroe of the Canadian Spinal Research Organization expects it will play an important role. We're going to see a combination of therapies that will help people um, with spinal cord injury and get some kind of curative, what I call, you know, restoration of function. And that would be a combination of epidural stimulation, a combination of stem cells injections, as well as what they call activity-based training. With just a week left in their time in Thailand, Ryan's dad concedes it has been a roller coaster for his son. But uh, I just tell him it's whether you're walking or not, you're going to have ups and downs. So make make the day a new day and let's uh, see what happens and go through it and fight through it and work through it. Next week, Ryan and his medical team will put his pair of hockey sled on the ice of this very rink. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Some other stories we're watching tonight on The National. Meng Wanzhou is marking the anniversary of her arrest in Vancouver. The Huawei chief financial officer issued a statement saying, quote, the past year has witnessed moments of fear, pain, disappointment, helplessness, torment, and struggle. Meng is awaiting extradition to the United States, while two Canadians, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, remain in Chinese custody. There were so many people out here who were unable to determine who was actually firing these shots. Ten people were wounded in a shooting in New Orleans' crowded French Quarter overnight. Two are in critical condition. Police detained one person, but it's unclear why. This was a really busy weekend in the city with the Bayou Classic. That's a major college football game happening at the Superdome. And in northern Mexico, 21 people are dead after gun battles this weekend between security forces and suspected members of drug cartels. Thousands of people took to the streets of Mexico City protesting continued violence and accusing President Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador of weakness. We've told you that the town of Asbestos, Quebec, is shopping for a new name, but we haven't shown you how that's going over with the people who live there. Sure, asbestos has toxic associations, but Simon Nakaneshny found that loyalty can be stronger than rebranding. This giant crater, now deserted, once gave this town life, money, and a name. But what was once billed as a magic mineral is now a dirty word. So town council is looking for a new name. When you identify yourself are coming from asbestos, people are sad. You know, for us, and, and, they, and sometimes they say, well, uh, do, you, do you have asbestos on you? Do you have any problem with asbestos? Local companies shy away from even using the address. Actually, we have 10 business in asbestos who has a postal address in Danville because they don't want to have asbestos, the name of asbestos on their box. But it's not as easy as swapping the signs. Around town, memories of the mine and its good-paying jobs are everywhere. For some who earn their living there, it's a legacy to be proud of. People were proud to work in the asbestos industry, says this local historian, and it's still like that. You know, a town, it doesn't change easily. At the local arena, many younger residents say a name change is inevitable but it won't change where they come from. No, I'm from asbestos. <laughs> yeah, it's going to stay like that. I think I think everyone from here is still going to name the place asbestos. The town will take suggestions for a name over the next six months. Then it will settle on something new. But the word asbestos will always loom large in this community, whether it's on the town sign or not. Simon Nakaneshny, CBC <laughs> News, Asbestos, Quebec. More news ahead on The National, including a new art fixture in Vancouver that is shining an unintended light on the city's problem with housing affordability. And a year after a brutal crash changed his life, he is promising to get back on the track. An intimate look at the rehab of Canadian race racer Robert Wickens. We are back right after this.
people in Vancouver may be so used to cranes in their city skyline, they don't even notice them anymore, but they cannot miss this one. That is a chandelier hanging underneath Vancouver's Granville Bridge. It's all part of a new public art installation commissioned by a luxury property, property developer and with a price tag in the millions, the reviews, as Tina Lovegreen tells us, are more than mixed. It draws you in as it lavishly spins out of control. Suspended from the underbelly of the Granville Street Bridge, the twisting cables twirl down a chandelier that weighs nearly the same as two cars. I love it. Totally love it. And I love the uh, lighting effects. They had sort of purple and everything the other night. Stopping pedestrians dead in their tracks and sparking conversation is Vancouver's latest and most expensive public art installation. The price tag? $4.8 million. It is aesthetically beautiful. Could $5 million be put into our infrastructure to support our most needed demographic? Absolutely. In a city grappling with a housing crisis, the piece is polarizing. Some call it tone deaf to have a symbol of wealth hang where homeless people once found refuge. I think it's grotesque. Um, I, don't, I don't like uh, using public money to display a symbol of wealth and luxury. The piece was fully paid for by the developer West Bank, but the city requires developers to contribute to public art. This one is just steps away from the Vancouver house built by West Bank, which is one of the most luxurious condos in the city. Pre-sales five years ago sold for over $1,000 a square foot. There's always going to be some debate, definitely. I mean, public art uh, draws attention, it draws focus, it causes strong emotions, it causes uh, strong critiques. The city knew the chandelier would be controversial, but says money for public art is separate from other requirements the developer has, like rental housing and green space. Well, you can always argue that there's a higher priority, particularly for an open-ended expenditure like affordable housing, in which case you end up being a city without art. And some say the public art piece has done exactly what it's intended to do, spark debate. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Next on The National, he was a rising star in Canada's racing world until one crash changed his life. We take you inside Robert Wicken's intense and emotional recovery. Plus... We're not allowed to forget. We have no right to forget. How international tourism and a hit TV show has changed the way the disaster of Chernobyl is being remembered. Look at that. Robert Wickens has come a long way in 15 months, but there's still so much to get used to for him. This is what the Canadian IndyCar driver's view used to look like. Back in the summer of 2018, he was living his dream rookie season until a crash left him paralyzed from the waist down. Jamie Strachan got a behind-the-scenes look at how Wickens is trying to recover the physical and mental tests he faces every day and a single-minded drive to both walk and race again. This is the track they call the Tricky Triangle because each of the three turns can ruin a racer's day. It's a tough track because all three corners um, are very different. Ready to go at Pocono Raceway. I was really confident going into the race. I was very confident. I knew exactly what I wanted to do at the start. Drivers, start your engines. Happy to qualify sixth. Um, I think it was sixth. Well, watch out for this guy, Robert Wickens. He will be on the move. I do remember going around the outside of um, one car, or two cars, I don't know, uh, in turn one. So look at Wickens on the outside making a move. But then I remember having a really good run down the back straight and trying to pass on the inside into turn two. And, and that's all I really remember. Here comes the red machine, the Lucas Oil entry. I, I've rethought that accident time and time again, looked at the footage, and I always think, like, why couldn't I have just 
maybe not tried to pass him, but I got to where I am in my career because of the type of driver that I was. It's because I always was attacking. I was never content with where I was. Give me five of those. Yeah, just go from that and back. Robert Wicken's body was pummeled by the crash. Back. Broken bones from head to toe, the extent of his injuries are easier to see on a chart than to list off in order. The bones have healed. His bruised spinal cord has not. It's not a broken leg where, you know, you're eight weeks in a cast and then you're right back at it. You, you know, it's this thing, like, no one knows what the outcome is. The fact that people told us at the beginning that I'll never walk again, they don't know. I'm trying to get this to let go. Your quad's tight. A lot has happened since the accident. Most days you can find him at this suburban Indianapolis rehab facility trying to teach parts of his battered body how to work again. Do you feel like you're, like you're ramping, like you're on the curve upwards over the last few months? Like, how, how do you, both emotionally and, and physically? When you have a good day, typically it follows by a couple bad days. Because I think whenever I do have that good day, I'm so excited to utilize it that I probably overtrain um, and work too hard, and then I'm fatigued for the subsequent kind of like 48 hours that follow. Okay. Taking it slow just isn't in Robert Wickens DNA. Wickens has always gone fast. He started racing go-karts as a kid. His family sold their home in Guelph, Ontario, so he could drive in Europe as a teenager. Back in North America, Wickens was a rising star, destined to reach the sport's highest levels. I was racing the best I've ever raced prior to the accident, and right now rehab's that full-time job. Some of the hardest work takes place on this treadmill. Wickens is fitted with special shorts and sealed inside. The system calibrates his weight and air blows upwards, filling the sealed chamber, reducing his body weight, making it easier to move his legs. But at the beginning of my walking, I was always like walking a tightrope. My legs just wanted to go like over top of one another. And that's gotten a lot better lately as well. So I can actually kind of keep them in line with each other. Um, but you can see like my left leg starting to shake now. You're really, I can see you're really bit. using your upper body yeah. to make that come through. Yeah, which isn't ideal. Here, I'm at 20 minutes. I'm going to stop here. Um, point two of a mile. He would like to push things further, but his legs have nothing left. Rehab can be grueling, hard on the body, harder on the mind. Almost as difficult as this injury is physically, mentally, it's, I think it's almost worse. Just rattles my brain. That left quad, let's do it. But Wickens isn't going through it alone. I'm Carly Wickens. That's the first time I'm <laughs> saying my new last name. <laughs> the couple was married just this fall. Wickens promised a first dance, and 13 months after being told he would probably not walk again, Wickens rose to the occasion. I think with our relationship, we had already lived together for four years before we got married and before the accident. So we were always together. So I think we already knew each other so well and the accident just brought us closer together. There's literally nothing that hidden anymore. No. Everything is out there. There yeah. he is. There he is. What's going on? <laughs> talking okay. about you. What you guys talking about? Talking about you dancing at the wedding. Uh. <laughs> Show him your, your arm. <laughs> the Wickenses have been very public about their lives together, documenting every step of Robert's recovery on social media. We have this great opportunity where we can help raise awareness and kind of show what a recovery might look like. And, uh, and that's been, it's been so supportive, it, it's blown me away. Wickens is back behind the wheel. Not exactly the breathtaking speed and risk he craves, but what's possible for now. There's days where Carly and I will sit on the couch 
And I'll just tell her that like I'm in a mood right now where I'm just really mad at the state that I'm in. And, and it's just, it's uncontrollable. And I, I don't know how long that's gonna happen for. Carly is the bright light on his darkest days, a committed passenger and navigator wherever the road takes them, however hard it may be. We're in therapy every week. Um, we do therapy together, I do therapy on my own. And I think that is so important for anybody going through any grieving process or spinal cord injury that not only the person that's injured should be going through therapy, but also the significant other. It's all unfolding, one small step at a time. The next chapter of their lives slowly being written, full of stops and starts and uncertain turns. Comebacks like the one Wiccans imagines can't be willed. Each injury is unique and each body responds differently. My, my dream is obviously to get back into a race car again, but there's, there's a lot that needs to happen. There's a, a lot that I need to still get on top of um, on a personal level, you know? I mean, there's a lot of unknowns with this injury still. You know, I'm still trying to just become stable in everyday life. I'm still trying to figure out how to live this life. Wickens says the crash is part of the inherent risk in racing, one he accepts with no regrets. It's how he's always done things, always pushing, never giving up, always trying to go faster. For The National, I'm Jamie Strachan in Indianapolis. As you just saw, Wickens has good days and some bad days. Last week, what started off as a fun Disney vacation ended early when he noticed the hardware in his leg was starting to get infected. He shared this picture and the news that he had to undergo yet another surgery in Indianapolis. He is now back at home and recovering. And Jamie Strachan has more from his interview with Robert Wickens online. Check out his story at cbcsports.ca. And next on The National, a change in remembering Chernobyl. Once the subject of a Soviet cover-up why a blockbuster HBO show as Russians shining a light on a dark part of history. But first. In case you missed it, it's over. Well, it feels great. A long battle in curling is finally done. Uh, I mean, really, when you do the right thing, it always feels really good. That's the CEO of Curling Canada, and that right thing Kathy Henderson refers to is establishing pay equity in the sport. Here it comes, facing three. Try. Payouts have always been imbalanced. The total prize money at the Briars, the men's competition last year, was $261,000. At the Scotties, the women's competition, it was $149,000. Inequity always an irritant. Curling has always been, you know, a highly a gender uh, equitable sport. Initial rationales for the disparity were about viewership ratings, the idea that the men had better numbers. But last year, the women bested the men for views during the playoffs and the finals. And it's 2019. <laughs> Pay equity is a long overdue discussion in sports right now, from tennis to soccer. <laughs> One remaining distinction in Canadian curling, when women win at the Scotties, Jewelry is part of the prize, and the bling will stay. The hit series Chernobyl has one thing in common with the nuclear accident that inspired it. People around the world could not look away. That nuclear accident in the Soviet Union is almost certainly the worst in history. Cold War secrecy gave it all an air of mystery. A drifting cloud of radioactive material meant stakes were high and borders meaningless. I'm worried about my child and I'm worried about the child that I'm carrying. 33 years later, lingering radiation does not keep the tourists away. Chris Brown found that even though significant dangers remain, that HBO show has set off a wave of curiosity about Chernobyl. Three, Action. Everything to do with Chernobyl is suddenly hot again. We're on a movie set in Budapest, where a Russian movie crew is playing catch up with the wildly popular HBO Chernobyl miniseries. It's making a Russian blockbuster version 
of the accident at reactor number four. Its star and director is Daniela Kozlovsky. I think it's extremely important to make such a film, to remind what happened in 1986. It's very important. We're not allowed to forget. We have no right to forget. Roll camera, roll sound. Kozlovsky says his focus is on the so-called liquidators, the men who braved astronomical levels of radiation to drain water from under the stricken reactor and save Europe from an even worse radioactive cloud. I believe our film, and this is a kind of patriotic film in a very good way. The HBO series hailed for its authentic portrayal of life in Soviet times and its searing criticisms of the government cover-up has sparked a Chernobyl revival. Well, the problem with nuclear stuff inside is that... Tour operators report a 30% increase in visitors to the Chernobyl site, 90 kilometers north of Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. Chernobyl souvenirs have never been more popular. Disaster tourism is booming. Most people we talked to had seen the HBO series. It shook me, to be quite honest. I sort of looked at it and I thought, I, I knew about Chernobyl, but I didn't really have a feel for the catastrophe and how it's all unfolded. We visited on a warm fall day recently. There's a 600 square kilometer exclusion zone where the radioactive fallout was the most intense. Access is restricted, but surprisingly, we learned it's far from empty. In fact, in the town of Chernobyl itself, 12 kilometers from ground zero, we met a woman who lived here when the explosion happened, and she's still here today. <laughs> her name is Maria Matrivna, Babushka Maria to her friends. She was a cleaning lady at the Chernobyl reactor. I've been living here for more than 80 years, she told us. If the radiation hasn't killed me yet, I've got nothing to be scared of. She's happy that all the interest has more people coming to her near-empty city and dropping by to say hi, though notably not her grandkids. The contamination is still bad enough that no one under the age of 18 is even allowed to visit. Radioactive isotopes degrade at different rates, so in some places the radiation isn't any higher than normal, but in other spots, extended exposure could be lethal. With dosimeters to measure our own exposure and a Geiger counter to test the radioactivity around us, we entered one abandoned village with our guide, Victoria Brosko. Uh, 0 0.26, 28, nothing dangerous, but once I bring it closer to the soil, 3.18, 6.71, 7.47. Is it safe to stand here? Well, um, it's safe if for, if for some minutes. We don't usually live in here. We do not consume the products from here. If we stood in this spot for an hour, we'd get a day's worth of natural radiation. As for the reactor itself, you can actually get pretty close, just a few dozen meters away. The destroyed unit is hidden under a new stainless steel dome. Firefighters, the first of them. Ukraine's government, which badly wants more foreign tourists, is promising to expand tourism here even more, including into areas previously off limits. If you put on a hazmat suit and you're very brave, you can now actually go inside the old control room of reactor four, but radiation levels are over 40,000 times what they are out here. We said no thanks. That 40,000 figure was widely reported after local media visited the control room recently, but Ukrainian officials insist the number is misleading as the tours bypass the most toxic areas and visitors get only a small, manageable dose of radiation. It, you know, that, that uh, to me seems uh, like a very uh, unwise thing to, to be doing. Canadian scientist Timothy Mousseau supports visiting Chernobyl, but not such extreme tourism. Mousseau has been coming here for 15 years to study the radiation in animals and plants 
in the exclusion zone. We did not venture into the control room number four simply because uh, the, the radiation levels in control room number one, which is you know half a half a kilometer away or almost a kilometer away, uh, are are also uh, you know above what we would normally want to experience. <laughs> Mousseau says the potential impact of even larger crowds is also concerning. Take the abandoned city of Pripyat, probably the most fascinating part of any Chernobyl visit. It's just three kilometers from the reactor. Today, it's frozen in time. Tourists can wander through the former amusement park unaccompanied. But Mousseau says the ground remains contaminated, and with large numbers of visitors, the risk of disturbing buried radioactive particles and sending them into the air again is high. That aspect of tourism in this area is something I do not support and, and think is, 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 is quite foolhardy, really. With the increased interest, though, has also come renewed appreciation for those who risk their lives to prevent the disaster from being even worse. Igor Pizminski and Andrei Mizko were both helicopter pilots. And just hours after the explosion, they were ordered to fly over the burning reactor as it spewed out radiation, dumping loads of sand and boron on the fire. Those flights likely cut short both of their careers. Andre had to stop flying as his internal organs were damaged. Radiation was to blame. Igor says seeing the disaster recreated so vividly on TV has allowed them to experience new pride about their role. И оно вот по-новому дает понимание того, что все-таки та работа, которая была выполнена многими людьми, в том числе и мной, была выполнена не зря, и об этом стоит говорить и дальше. А в своей стране нам внимание, благодаря сериалу «Чернобыль», только сейчас колыхнулся, опять к нам интерес этот появился, вспомнили за нас. Fans of the Chernobyl story will have to wait until the fall of 2020 to see how the Russian movie producers tell their version of the story. And remarkably, Russia's Atomic Energy Corporation, Rosatom, is helping finance it. Such is its renewed appeal that even the nuclear energy industry sees value and linking itself to the heroes of Chernobyl. Chris Brown, CBC News in Chernobyl, Ukraine. So interesting. Still ahead on the national, a made-for-the-movies kind of moment is our moment. One high school student's big game ahead. And this week, CBC News is going in-depth on vaping. How did it get so popular? What did Health Canada know of its potential risks? And why is vaping having such an effect on young Canadians? If you have questions, we want to hear from you. Our panel of experts will be ready to answer them. Send them to the national at cbc.ca. Reed DeMello loves basketball, but as team manager for his high school in Port Moody, BC, he usually spends his time off the court. DeMello has Down syndrome. He's extremely popular with his team, so when they were behind during a game, they asked him to play. He got the ball and tossed it from the three-point line. What happened next is our moment. <laughs> We recently hosted our annual Kodiak Classic Basketball Tournament, which features the top team, senior boys teams in the province. I feel awesome, great, nervous. I was on the court, um, nervous for a bit. I love it. The Reed is one of the biggest supporters of that team. Uh, he's been involved and happened to be on the bench that day supporting the team. Um, and it led to, to that moment. 
we had about 1,300 kids in the crowd, and they were chanting for Reed to come in the game, um, knowing how special that would be for him. So it's quite emotional to see, you know, all your kids together come together as one and, and support each other. And he's very popular, and um, they were just excited for him, period. And that's why they mobbed him the way they did. And it means to me, I feel like my, this my home, this my home, School, I love it being here. Good job, Reed. There are NBA stars who can't make that shot. Shot. And speaking of those stars, apparently you want to meet Steph Curry. I was hoping it would be a Raptor, but Steph Curry is definitely a star. Here's hoping he answers the call. That is a national for Sunday, December the first. Good night.